This video is brought to you by our sponsor, My Actual Wallet. My Wallet is the number one waste of disposable income. My Wallet has been responsible for over 384 Amazon orders in 2021 alone. This is the Techlast F7 Plus, which caught my eye while I was browsing Banggood a while back. I really like the 8GB of RAM, the 256GB SSD, and the full HD IPS screen. In fact, I wondered how it could possibly be any good for under 350 bucks. And then I wondered if other people might wonder the same thing, and so, uh, here we are. All thanks to our sponsor, My Wallet. I wouldn't have bought a Techlast F7 for myself. It's not a bad little laptop by any means, but I'll spoil the rest of the review by telling you that the CPU is a Celeron N4100. It doesn't sound bad on paper having 4 cores and a 2.4 GHz burst speed, but its 1.1 GHz base frequency is woeful, and it has 4 MB of level 2 cache and no L3 cache, as is the way of Celerons. This leads to sluggish performance, which can be frustrating even during web browsing and while using productivity apps. Just as a point of reference to a mid-range CPU contemporary to the N4100, the i5-8400 is a 14 nanometer process chip that was launched in Q4 of 2017, just like the tech last Celeron. It has a slightly smaller L2 cache, but more L1 and 9 megabytes of L3. It's also got a base frequency of 2.8 gigahertz and supports up to 128 gigs of RAM, while the N4100 has an absolute max of 8 gigs. The i5 has also got Intel UHD graphics 630 built in, while the Celeron has the 600 version. An i5 of that generation is more than sufficient for any non-intensive workload, and will be buttery smooth for doing basic productivity tasks. Here's the party piece of the Celeron, though. It has a thermal design power of a mere 6 watts, less than a tenth of the i5. It's a true mobile processor, and that shows in long battery life. Let's get this out of the way. Do I recommend the Techlast F7? No, not really. But if your utmost concern is low price and long battery life, then it's a pretty good choice from what I can tell for watching video and doing other non-intensive tasks. But if you're looking for a super slim laptop that will work great for staying productive while traveling, I recommend a used Lenovo X1 Carbon from 2014. I'm not smoking crack, I promise. I got this second generation copy for about 500 bucks back in 2017, and it's been my travel and couch buddy up until this year. The thing is that now in 2021, you can get one of these in near mint condition and fully spec'd out for less than the price of the Techlast. You can probably get a third gen for about the Techlast's price. So it might seem stupid and insane at first to do a comparison review against a six year old flagship notebook, but that's exactly what I'm doing more or less. The X1 Carbon is about the same size and weight as a Techlast F7, but has a better performing CPU and a higher resolution screen. Actually, this one is a touch screen, but I don't care for it because of the glare and the fact that it's actually pretty awkward to use a laptop screen that way. But unlike the Techlast, they do have non-glossy variants, which are a lot nicer in sunny airport terminals and such. The downside to the older X1 Carbons is that their batteries won't go the distance, probably as a combination of age and their higher power consumption. The Techlast actually shocked me with the video playback test by going for 9 hours and 58 minutes at 50% brightness. And this was with YouTube and Firefox, which is significantly less efficient than Chrome, and probably all Chromium variants. The X1 Carbon only managed 3 hours and 45 minutes under that same video playback test. So if sheer longevity is your main concern, then the Techlast is a clear winner. In fact, battery life is on par with some real-world tests of the MacBook Air. Though supposedly the newest model has an absurd battery life, no idea personally. But with the Techlast, that's going to come at the cost of hinky-jinky input lag and stuttering. I'm not talking about games, I just mean navigating around Windows. In fact, I'm not going to talk about games at all in this review. If you're looking for a gaming laptop, even casual games, this is not going to be it. I'm not sure if that even needed to be said, given that the word Celeron appears in its specs, though. The F7 does have a great looking screen. It sure seems like an IPS panel is advertised. Great viewing angles, very bright and vivid. For those of you that are curious, the screen balances at 6000K, and that's with no special color profile loaded. The very bottom of the blacks are a bit crushed, though. This image has been exaggerated to hopefully come through all the transcoding to YouTube to give you an idea of the brightness range out of the box. It looks better than the Lenovo screen, for sure. Unfortunately, unlike the Lenovo, the Techlast has a 6-bit panel, giving a maximum of about 260,000 colors. However, it implements FRC, or frame rate control, to give an apparently full 8-bit color palette of over 16 million colors. To my eye, the screen looks like an 8-bit display through the casual observation of viewing video and some images here and there. The F7 was able to play 1080p 60fps YouTube videos without too much of a hiccup, 
and I was able to play UHD 60 FPS videos just fine in VLC and Windows Media Player, or whatever it's called nowadays. It did struggle with UHD YouTube content, though. Of course, the screen is only full HD, but that test was more about the chipset and or the CPU's ability to scale and render the video. But it is impressive that they managed to clone Ansel Adams and stick him inside that very bezel. At least I assume that's what they did to get such horrible performance out of a webcam. If you'd consider buying this laptop for regular Zoom or whatever meetings, well, I guess you don't have to dress up nice or comb your hair because no one would know the difference. So maybe it's actually a plus nowadays. On the other hand, you'll sound like you're talking through a tin can due to the poor quality mic, and the people on the other end won't sound much better on the tech last tinny speakers. This is just being recorded by Windows built-in camera app. Uh, the video is incredibly choppy as I'm seeing it. I don't know how it's recording, but we'll find out in a second. This is just being recorded by Windows built-in camera app. Uh, the video is incredibly choppy as I'm seeing it. I don't know how it's recording, but we'll find out in a second. The keyboard isn't much better. The keys have a clacky feel, but I'm not talking Cherry MX switches. It's more like cheap plastics. I found the layout easy enough to type on, but it definitely shows its price point. I love the feel and layout of the Carbons keyboard, at least given its small form factor. Wi-Fi in the tech last was rock solid and never disconnected or flaked out. I don't have any solid speed test data to share due to a lack of thorough testing methodology, but I was able to max out my 200 megabit internet connection while testing. The old Lenovo can of course do the same. The power supply is a bone of contention for me. Most of the time when I plug it in, it sparks significantly even with no load connected. I'm assuming it has a rather honking capacitor and not much in the way of current inrush limiting. It also feels cheap in that super light way that low quality PSUs have. The Carbon X1 comes with a large brick of a PSU, relatively speaking, but at least it has a heavy and solid feel of quality, and it doesn't throw off sparks at the plug. These are minor points, but I'm not a fan of the design of the power connector either. It's a very thin barrel plug that's just looking to get damaged the first time you put this on your lap while sitting cross-legged. It's also a right angle plug, but the jack sits directly between the USB port and the HDMI port, making it a bit of an awkward arrangement if those ports are in use. In both a positive and negative for this generation of carbon, it uses a proprietary Lenovo connector. The good thing is that it's quite heavy duty and can stand up to more abuse than the standard barrel plug. The downside is that it's not a USB-C like most laptops nowadays, including the newer carbons. As for the HDMI port, it's only an HDMI mini. The X1 Carbon, for example, has a full-size connector, which is much better for traveling and presentations in places where you might not be using your own cable. That's a niche issue at best, but I figured I'd mention it. Interestingly, the bottom of the laptop has a hatch which exposes the SSD. That's a nice touch and something rarely found in laptops nowadays. The computer is pretty easy to open up, there's 10 torque screws underneath, and then the bottom pops right off to reveal the battery and motherboard. Inside is pretty sparse. The battery is a 38 watt hour lithium ion flat pack design that's relatively easy to remove with four screws. The RAM is of course soldered to the board and isn't upgradable anyway due to the CPU's 8 gigabyte limit. The motherboard is tiny and completely self-contained. In other words, it can make a nice embedded computer for a project. All I had to do was bridge a couple of dedicated power switch pins from the keyboard to start it up with the PSU attached. It's fully functional with an external monitor and keyboard. So if you can pick up a unit with a damaged screen or some such really cheap on eBay, it might be worth it just for the wee little main board. Taking a look at the SSD, it's got a single storage chip on board, which is labeled thusly and appears to be of the 3D TLC NAND variety, having a 256 gigabyte capacity or thereabouts. The controller chip is a silicon motion package, which brags about being cost reduced in its marketing materials. As for the main board, there isn't too much exciting going on. There's an ITE IT8987E2 integrated controller handling stuff like ACPI, keyboard input, PWM for the monitor, and system power management. The CPU is labeled SR3S0, which is indeed a Celeron N4100 launched in Q4 of 2017 using 14 nanometer lithography and, as I said earlier, has a TDP of only 6 watts. Hence there is no active cooling in this laptop, which is an advantage it has over the Carbon X1. RAM is made up of a pair of 32 gigabit, or 4 gigabyte, LPDDR4-3733 chips of unknown provenance. The LP and LPDDR stands for low power, and that's in keeping with the CPU and overall low power consumption. The specs of the RAM at 3733 MHz far exceed the Celeron's maximum of 2400 MHz, which is good as it's giving the CPU all the memory bandwidth it can take. 
The Wi-Fi module is actually an Intel branded wireless AC card capable of operating in both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Interestingly, it doesn't have an integrated Bluetooth module. Sound is provided by a fairly generic Realtek chip designed circa 2009. Nothing special, but absolutely bog standard and more than adequate for this laptop. There's a little daughter board on the right side of the unit supporting a USB port, a headphone jack, and a TF card slot for which there's a Realtek card reader controller chip. In conclusion, I like the Techlast F7 for its price and considering what it is. It's not a bad laptop per se. It's well made and it does everything it says on a tin. It's like the little engine that couldn't, but I give it credit for trying. It scored about 700 on Nova Bench, and its quote-unquote GPU performance was particularly woeful. While the second-gen Carbon X1 didn't perform much better at around 800, it certainly has a better overall feel despite its advanced age. Despite my liking the little guy, I can't really recommend it. Even for basic productivity tasks and web browsing, it stutters and stalls on occasion, leading to a frustrating user experience. More broadly speaking, if you happen to come across a laptop or a mini PC bearing an Intel Celeron processor, I would advise you to stay away. Either go the extra mile for the type of machine you want with a modern i5 CPU, or equivalent AMD, or check the used market for older gen i5 or i7 machines at the same price point as the brand new Celeron-based computer you're looking at. And just as a side note, when buying a used laptop on eBay, you should immediately eschew any listings that have few pictures or low resolution pictures. Also, ignore any where the seller has less than 99.5% feedback, an extremely low feedback count, or no recent feedback as a seller. When you do find one with high-quality pictures, examine them carefully for damage and wear, and keep in mind that if some aspect of the computer isn't shown in the pictures, it may be because the seller is trying to hide damage, even if it's minor. If in doubt, either skip the listing or ask for more pictures and or details about the condition. It takes a bit of research, but I've picked up numerous used laptops that are in like-new condition in the aftermarket that are far cheaper than similarly performing brand new models at the same price point. And I guess if you're really uncertain, you can always ask that cousin that knows computers for advice, but they'll probably tell you it depends. Thanks for watching, I've been Scott, and for updates on this topic or more information as questions get asked and answered, check out my website at s.co.tt.